Hello and welcome back to Coin Scrum Markets. Um, I'm delighted to be joined again by Patrick Heuser, Head of Trading at Crypto Finance. How are you doing, Patrick? Good. Thanks a lot for having me again. No, you're welcome. Always very welcome. Always, uh, always keen to hear your thoughts on the markets. Um, and that's what we're going to do again. Um, things have quietened down a little bit, I think, from uh, a few weeks ago, but uh, still hovering around all time highs and market caps kind of nearing 2 trillion in total for all crypto assets. So still interesting. Um, what's your thoughts on the market and what was what's kind of standing out to you at the moment? Well, what's standing out is definitely the, the bullish undertone we see, we continuously see. Um, we see from retail guys buying small pieces to the real big guys putting um, Bitcoins on their balance sheets. So it's, it is, um, as we have seen already, like six to three months ago, the, the sentiment has, has changed quite a bit and it's just, it keeps going, which is to me quite, um, quite astonishing, um, but also reflected, as you said, in the price and in the total market cap. So there is, there is still interest um, in this new asset class and there are still people banging at the door who want to get in. Yeah, I mean, we, the, the, the buy the buy the dip story still seems to be there. I mean, you know, when people ask, you know, is this is this potentially a top? Are we just going to carry on? I think historically, when we've seen a significant top, it's re been relatively short lived. Um, and got things have got very volatile, and um, you know, it doesn't seem to be the same sort of price action at the moment. Um, and you know, back end of last year, when we saw some of the well documented um you know treasury purchases from some of those big players that were coming in you know that seemed to obviously be taking the market in that kind of one single direction what's what's from what you're seeing from maybe your own clients or just your sense uh, um a, a guy still looking to allocate and they're just being patient and you know not feeling like they need to really push the price um it's it's again a bit of um that the ones who are long they're be cautious now. They, they're not quite sure, are we going to hit a new all-time high anytime soon? The, the other ones, as you just mentioned, they're asking, oh, can I buy now? Isn't it not too expensive to go in now? So we feel a bit um, clients being on the sidelines or a bit cautious. Um, but then on the derivative side, there is still a lot of um, gambling interest out there. I mean, there is lots of volume getting pumped through these um, exchanges. And I mean, today, again, we saw over a billion dollars got liquidated on the, on the short dip we have seen of like 2000 points. Um, but again, it, it just shows that people are a little bit on the um, on the cautious side, I would say. I mean, our our client base is rather buying and holds, but the, the buying has um, has slowed down a bit. Right. Okay. But yeah, it does seem that those dips are short lived still, and so money's on the sidelines, and people looking to kind of you know take advantage of any of those pullbacks. Um, you mentioned the futures markets there. I said one piece of news um, came out this week. CME have decided to launch a micro contract. Uh, we had them on the show a while ago and uh, did ask them, given the, the price rise and um, the main contract um, being uh, denominated five Bitcoins uh, as a contract size. I uh, wondered if they were going to look to launch a mini or a micro contract. They have. I guess that's just going to open up the market to a broader, broader audience on their side. Well, I, gu I guess so. But the thing is, I mean, who, who's actually playing on the CME? It's, it's more institutional, isn't it? And yes, of course, you can now trade the contract um, or the, the micro contract through your IB brokerage um, account. But still, people um, dealing on the CME are more um, institutional clients and they mm. probably don't really care about the size of the contract if it's a quarter of a million or if it's just a hundred thousand dollars worth in yeah. in bitcoins but it it might take out a bit of um the volatility because you can hatch a bit um closer to to your actual exposure mm -hmm. that might help uh, we it it remains to be seen how um, how deep the, the liquidity will be on that on that new micro contract. 
Yeah, um, I mean, it's proven successful when they've um, launched those contracts, similar contracts in other markets. Um, and I just, I guess it's another good sign that they, they're seeing demand for it. Um, and so I guess that's positive as a whole. Um, what else have we seen this week? I saw, uh, uh, you know, the Tether story that had been lingering seemed to be cleared up a little bit a few weeks ago. Um, it was reported that they've actually uh, posted um, uh, a, an assurance report from a Cayman based accountant called Moore. Um, that was kind of reported yesterday. Is this kind of, I mean, I don't know if that how substantive that is. I know if you look at USDC, they're audited by Grant Thornton. Um, you know, I, I guess it's uh, a level of progress. Have we, is that, have we put that story to bed now? Um, are we moving away from that? Um, I th the fathers will never sleep, right? They will never move away. So there will always be people claiming that it's not fully backed and there is a scam behind it, but it's, it's a step into the right direction and it's definitely um, um, a, a good progress in, in, in the whole stablecoin environment um, as well with uh, Visa um, getting into the, the whole stablecoin business with USDC. So the, the first sort of hurdles for, let's call it the normies, that have no exposure to cryptos whatsoever, they, they, they get the first sort of bridge um, in front of them and they can pass it if they want. And it, it just helps the, the ecosystem to, to mature and, and, and attract more flows. So I think it's quite good. And it, it was good to see that uh, Tether had uh, this positive feedback on that. Yeah, sure. And you mentioned that, um, I think it was yesterday that uh, Visa announced that, that I mean, they, they, they'd announced it um, last year, back end of last year, that they were going to be uh, integrating with uh, USDC. Um, and then it seems that, um, yeah, the first transactions went through, I think, via Crypto.com's Visa card. Uh, so it's good to see that in action. Um, again, in the same articles, reporting on that news that um, they're, they're working with Anchorage on the custody side. So, you know, good to see these things moving forward. Um, PayPal at the same time announced this week that, um, again, they've both been speaking about it, but they were opening up um, crypto payments to 29 million merchants. Uh, and I think backed again, another uh, kind of uh, been sort of long time coming, but back had been working on uh, their own solutions, providing kind of a loyalty systems and applications around crypto. And I think they've rolled that out to Starbucks now. So we've got this, um, this has always been kind of a long-standing thing. I you know, remember when there was a big push a good few years ago where the assumption would be that, you know, uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies essentially would be used for payments. And there was quite a bit of merchant adoption back then because it made sense. I mean, Coinbase were pushing merchant adoption, BitPay were pushing merchant adoption, but no one wanted to spend their Bitcoins. You know, it made sense. It was easy for merchants to come on board. You know, if uh, you know, reduced fees was an incentive, then obviously it was a no brainer. No one wanted to spend their Bitcoins. Do you think people are going to want to spend their Bitcoins now? <laughs> I, I, I don't think so. Um, I, still, I still believe it's more marketing than, than anything else to have um, merchants um, connected to the, the cryptocurrency payment rails. And, and we discussed it as well on, on the visa part and the USDC part. It's, I think it's still a very closed um, ecosystem. So if you have, you're a visa card holder and you now have USDC, for example, that, that USDC is most probably not very easily transferable into the DeFi sector. So it, it you 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 have this is probably your the closest thing to have a digital dollar, like a digitized dollar, but it's still not crypto. And on the other side, um, I have crypto. Would I transfer my cryptos to a payment service and then buy a coffee with it? Not really. So mm. it, it's to me it's 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 still that um, that. that that big gap between the traditional market and the, the traditional payment rails, having them digitized and have maybe a stable coin as well in it, mm -hmm. but to transfer it over to the, let's call it the real crypto ecosystem, that's still not, that's still not there. That it, it's not flowing to me at the moment. Yeah. And I think the, 
you know, the point around that conversation is that, you know, if you compare these currencies uh, to traditional currencies, then typically we earn our, our currency uh, it, with our paycheck at the end of the month. And that's what you spend. Um, and that's what starts creating more of a closed loop economy. And maybe we're still not seeing enough people. I'm, I'm sure it's growing now, but the amount of people actually earning earning Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies to then have them to spend, maybe that's the sort of cycle that we need to still, uh, that's still missing. I, I, I got one point to make here. I mean, what, what I would like to see and what would be really interesting if this could ever happen is, let's, let's assume you have um, USDC on your Visa card and you get paid, I don't know, in the US, maybe 2% interest rate on your real dollars on your bank account. But you can get, you probably get paid 12% on your USDCs in the DeFi sector. So if for whatever, if they, if they can bridge it and, and you can use your USDCs on your Visa account in the DeFi sector and earn 12%, that would be really interesting to see what happens then. Yeah, I mean. And if this ever can happen. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a real opportunity. Um, and I guess the, you know, the broader infrastructure question comes into play, but we've seen, you know, that whole side of things maturing. So, you know, I, I think in the current interest rate environment, that's, that's got to be a no brainer. And uh, uh, as people start offering those opportunities and services, I'm sure that will uh, attract a fair amount of business. Um, cool. I'm just conscious on time. So we need to wrap up shortly, but um, another piece of uh, news that I noticed uh, yesterday was some updated guidance from FATF um the uh kind of global regulator um um and there's there's stuff in there around DeFi. um they've kind of defined dApps, decentralized applications um and this has always been a question for me at what point do they start kind of looking over the fence and you know do they start looking at the software developers the people publishing the code uh, users, you know, undoubtedly the question over AML, KYC was always going to come into play. Seems like this is kind of the first shot across the bow. Um, is this going to be something that, you know, DeFi developers uh, and platform operators are going to have to start being concerned about? I think it's, it gives me, it is a concern for me for as, as a DeFi user as well. And as a believer in, in this kind of new concept or system, how I can manage my own money. Uh, but then on the other side, what we also see is, um, for example, um, protocols like Aave are teaming up with um, custody or storage provider, trying to you know offer a joint service that the custody or storage provider can basically lend the the client's coins to the Aave protocol and they figured as well mm, this doesn't really work if um, the clients are institutional clients and the, the storage or custody provider is a regulated entity he cannot just lend to a smart contract platform and then and they tackle it with different versions and they sort of try to say well we have a version which is only for white labeled users they um, they went through kyc and aml and that might be the the future of defi that you have the current environment which is a non-regulated let's call it retail single user environment and then you would have a more regulated environment where banks and institutional and regulated institutional clients plug it in and they're all white labeled Obviously, the interest rates or the, um, the prices will be different in, in, in the two environments. But I think this is what it starts to, um, what, what the result will be when, when regulators hack into this. They, they have to sort of split it and make two environments. Yeah, no, I, I tend to agree. And I think that's kind of where we're heading. It is good that, you know, um, projects such as Arve, I know they announced last year, was it, that they'd... Um, that obtained, uh, I think it was an EMI license out of the UK. So, you know, they've had that in mind and I think it's a smart move. I think these things need to be optional and that's how we'd like to see it progress. Um, and, you know, the people that need to and require uh, that more compliant 
um, kind of version of these platforms, it would be amazing that they can participate. I guess the final bit on that, that does all tie into identity, which has always been my sort of long term theme for bringing all of this together. And um, again, it's, a, it's, a, it's been a long running uh, project for Microsoft. They announced it way back, I can't remember, it was a good few years ago that, and I think it was very forward thinking of them that you know, their first blockchain use case was going to be around identity. Um, and they finally launched their uh, ION identity platform, which operates on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. And they've been working with a number of companies within, within the industry to, to, again, to have brands like Microsoft pushing, you know, public blockchains for these use cases and knowing that something like identity can't be ignored in the long run if this is to scale. And these things are coming into the market all at the same time. So I think, you know, obviously there's going to be certain gray areas for a while, but it does seem like we're on the right path for, uh, for kind of achieving those results for the people um, that, that, that need things structured in that way. So look, we'll finish up there. We've run out of time, Patrick. Always uh, great to have you on to share your thoughts and we'll have you back again in a few weeks. It was a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Yes. Bye, Paul.